Pre-game analysis. Pre-game analysis. Indeed. Uh, would you yeah, say we, we, have, think, uh, so? we have three big theaters of war, maybe, if we were to say, like, uh, Europe slash Africa, uh, if we just assume that Poland, Netherlands, and France will fall. We have the Africa uh, front, uh, we have the Eastern front, and we have the Pacific front. So if we go them uh, one by one, if we, if we start with the, the African front, um, main players there will be Sean as the UK, uh, Pontus as Canada, uh, perhaps Skoginge and Ville as Australia and South Africa on the Allied side, and then the Germans, Magnus Mosberg, and the Italians, Rosen, on the Axis side. Um, it, quite even matchup, I would say. Uh, but since, since Sean is an un, untried card in our community, I can't really, I can't really say how, how strong his impact will be. Yeah, he came with a comment now in the chat box. Seventh Armor Desert Rats will return. <laughs> so maybe that gives us a hint of what the UK is thinking. And we do know that Rosen is um, is a fierce and dangerous player. So um, I don't know. I would maybe put a slight advantage on the Axis in Africa. I might have to eat that up, but uh, that's my early assessment here. Yeah. Yeah, it will be very interesting to see how that uh, that front moves. It's also one of those where you really have the possibility of impact from like how the Mediterranean develops. Because uh, if you manage to get like the naval superiority, if you get like uh, uh, your fleet out, uh, naval bombers, if you manage to take like Crete, Cyprus, Malta, you have a lot of potential for different naval landings and different ways to disrupt the otherwise rather static front around El Alamein. So, uh, so that will be very interesting to see. Also, there's a lot of potential for like the encirclement traps where you let the opposing side push a bit and then you try to encircle and so on. So it can be very dynamic and it can have a very high game impact potentially later. Uh, if you manage to to win in North Africa, especially like if the Axis manage to uh, take a victory in North Africa, then uh, uh, they do not have to worry about naval invasions from there as much late game, and of course vice versa for the for the Allies that also in that case deprives the Axis of important oil production. Indeed. Yeah. The naval game will, uh, maybe not as much as the Pacific, but you know the naval game is super important. As you mentioned, the airfields on all the islands. And also the front is super narrow at places, so short bombardment uh, can also play a vital role uh, in many places there. So um, winning the naval war, winning the air war, having enough tanks. It will be very um, interesting. Yeah, definitely. It's one of those fronts where you also see like the impacts of the early economy can turn the tide if you manage to just get out more units. And uh, it's also a front for innovation. I remember, Algot, you did some uh, stuff with Italy, like with uh, super heavy carriers and, uh, and things. Yes, I was a little bit overshadowed by the by the USA who built a lot more super heavy carriers, but <laughs> we were on different teams, we had no communication with each other, but we both built uh, super heavies. And uh, yes, they can be very effective, um, especially if you sit in safety in your own sea zone with air cover, and then you can just send out your uh, send out your navs to the other other zone and just sink everything. Uh, can be very dangerous. And uh, a smart UK like Johannes, he he kept his fleet away. Um, so we didn't see any major engagements, but it left the, the way open for, for, for me and my faction to, to gain ground. So yeah. Was... yeah, I'm, I'm trying to stay silent of this theater since uh, I know the UK build uh, already. Uh, I've seen it, so I won't comment too much. But um, if I would guess on Rosen playing on the Italian side and put some what do you call it, uh, so, some thoughts into his head. Um, he usually likes uh, paratroopers uh, and he likes doing very specialized, uh, small, uh, high-risk moves. Uh, not that uh, far from your play style, Algot. So um, I think that he will definitely try to surprise us in some way uh, on the Allied side. But um, He's uh, a slightly more competent version than, of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let's see what happens. Yep, it will be interesting yeah. indeed. Yeah.
Well, moving on, should we take the Pacific next then? It's a very interesting theater. Uh, we have a rematch here, uh, actually. Uh, Martin and Jakob, uh, main controllers of USA and Japan. They were the main controllers of USA and Japan, but uh, vice versa on the Bergwood Hof. Uh, a struggle between those two nations uh, who, that lasted pretty much all game. Um, it was a fierce and bloody Pacific theater last time. So, um, yeah, Jakob is out for revenge, and uh, Martin is out to prove that... Uh, you can't lose with twice as many dockyards, I think. <laughs> yeah, it will. It will indeed be an interesting front. Also, we have the uh, we have the Siam, we have the Raj. Uh, it will be interesting to see what what Dankus comes out with here, because uh, uh, Dankus is. Uh, I mean, he's a very good uh, micro player, and uh, he is uh, a well-known streamer. But that also means that there exists a lot of data on him. So uh, it is uh, possible, in a sense, to look a lot at his earlier games, and we will see if the Axis does that and are able to deduct something from that. It's, Maybe it's like there scouting are scouting before a football yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there are tendencies to exploit, but uh, generally, if uh, a competent rush, it's hard. It's hard not to crack, especially if you, if the mod has the um, the functions that you you can't. You can rush, uh, attacking rush, but you will get debuffs if you don't take Singapore first or uh, parts of the uh, other parts of the Pacific Theater first. So you get and, a bit more time to... Build. Yeah, and also we, we will announce new rules uh, in this theater uh, before this game. So uh, in order to... Um, um, like Japan, Manchu and Siam are not allowed to build a western harbor on the... Manila Peninsula before controlling the strait bet between Sumatra and uh, uh, Malaya. So they need basically to control Singapore and Sumatra before they are allowed to build a western harbor. So which means if they want to naval invade Raj in the back early, they have to uh, go all the way around Indonesia, basically, uh, to be able to naval invade, which is a very long way. So um, uh, I think thanks But there's also uh, a port... Uh... In uh, in Burma, which you can capture. Yes, of course, but then you have to push through the front yes. line. Um, but yeah, but we, which means that uh, I don't think that tankers will be that afraid of an early naval invasion in the back. Um, you, you you will see it coming um, uh, quite far away this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, like we've had a very hot uh, hot debate regarding super heavy carriers, or, or if they are supposed to be banned before the next game or not. Uh, and I think we have a, a four to four vote right now. With uh, yeah, exactly. With so, I uh, haven't voted yet. Uh, but, uh, and uh, Martin is against the super heavy carriers, and um, uh, Jakob is for super heavy carriers. And it's kind of mm -hmm. funny because uh, US is the team, the country that can really exploit uh, this with all the Chromium staying in the Allies. So uh, Martin is right now voting against the Navy that could give him a secure victory on the sea. So, but Martin is, also the, uh, yeah. Martin is also the Eddard Stark of Hearts of Iron. He will, uh, yeah. he will put honor before winning. Uh, yeah. I think yeah, it will be interesting to see that. He will lose his head before winning, that's what yeah, you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. think we'll see a lot of good plays here. Jakob is really aware that he has Martin and Dankus on either side of him, and I think he will, as we said earlier, really plan accordingly. And I, I really look forward to seeing this, uh, since I will be on, in another theater through the uh, studio later on. You'll see how he deals with uh, in uh, China war, how he deals with Raj, how he deals with the Navy, uh, trying to meet up with these two, two competent uh, players on each side. And I think he will coordinate his team extremely well. So, yeah. So, so just looking at, at the matchup, I would put a slight advantage to the allies in the Pacific. But saying that, we know that Jakob is an extremely competent player and a competent planner. Um, so it will be very exciting to see what he's up to. And uh, he will have to have some sort of elaborate plan to just because the production is so uneven. Because, yeah. you know, the time is against him. There are more players on the Allied side. Um, he will have to come up with something, uh, something quite smart to, um, to yeah. be able to, to triumph. 
Yeah, it will be an interesting front to say the least. Also, their finest bro, we have this debuff. So the war in Europe is affected by the war in the Pacific. So if you capture certain victory points like Singapore and Hong Kong and stuff like that, uh, you do provide uh, debuffs or buffs for uh, your respective side uh, of the war in Europe. So that can also affect the game. And also we will see the machinations and the politics of uh, our uh, central committee here, whether or not the super heavy carriers will be used. Uh, I think the rules will be posted uh, uh, once they are decided. We have had some questions in the chat about the uh, possibility of new, new rules. Uh, so now you have heard that they are indeed under review. And uh, we also try to uh, adapt the rules after, after every game. Uh, you experts look over the rules and see what needs to be tweaked and improved in order to get fun and exciting games. Uh, so, yeah. And then the last theater is uh, the Ost Front, the Eastern Front, which if you would say four, four games out of five or nine games out of ten is the deciding factor. Uh, whether you like it or not, it's, it's, it's on the East Front that's, that the, the game is decided. It's the main event. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's also the hardest to cover on stream because they're like, yeah, yeah you there can't. is so much going on. There is so much going on, and it will be uh, very exciting to see because I think we have a very even matchup. Um, if we just put the Soviets and the and the Germans in, next to each other, I would say yes, the Soviets might have a slight advantage with Francis having played as main controller of Soviets twice before, and both the co-ops are also veterans uh, in the game in general, but also on Soviets. In general, but then you go into the Balkans and you see that uh, we have Don on Bul uh, on um, Hungary, we have Jonta on Bulgaria. Um, there's a lot of backup to be had for Magnus uh, as the as the main controller of Germany. So it's hard to say which side to has that has the edge here. Yeah, but also um, I know that the Boat is a new player in our community, but I know that he has quite a lot of experience as well uh, playing in Romania. Um, and then we also have uh, Eriksson, uh, of course, on uh, Finland, uh, give, will, who will definitely give up a very hard um, um, defense against the Soviets, uh, or might even turn that into an offense. Um, so... Um, yeah, the short, the, the inexperience of the German side will definitely, you know, they have a very strong uh, round of players um, on the Eastern Front. So um, I wouldn't count them out at all. Um, and then, of course, we, we have Erik Ars on Mongolia, who recently played a very, very competent Bulgaria on the Eastern Front the last time he played. Um, sharing a lot of uh, pockets and overruns um, as well. So, um, to be honest, I think I'll, I'll, I'll give it from my side slight advantage uh, to the Axis uh, on the Eastern Front uh, in a total. But, you know, Francis, uh, I know last time he played Soviets, I know that uh, Jakob played Bulgaria. He had 8 million kills as Bulgaria. <laughs> And Francis still had 5 million uh, uh, troops still that in the front line, and it was completely intact. <laughs> so <laughs> Francis just did one template, and they just spammed it, and they couldn't get through. They kept on killing uh, Francis' front line, and they couldn't get through. So um, I think Francis would put up a really, really strong you know, focus on defense, not dying, rather than biting. Uh, but yeah. I don't know. We have two different kinds of leader styles also with Magnus and uh, and Francis, I think, um, with the, the latter being like maybe on the, the screaming side of the motivation, motivation table and uh, Magnus being more like a good cop, uh, tell me what you need to win, I'll lend lose you what you need to win and maybe like a, <laughs> a mom and a dad. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Francis do the Stalin role very well, I yeah, think. Very well. <laughs> yes. He will uh, he will collapse in the beginning of the war and go away from the computer and let his co-op take over, and then he comes back half an hour later with new energy and uh, issues order two two seven. Yeah, indeed. But, uh, yeah, but also I think that uh, Magnus he did he played my second in command uh, Germany recently, and together with you Algot um, he controlled the northern front uh, of the Axis, and you guys you just ripped Martin Soviet apart up there. So uh, 
also Magnus has a lot of experience on these in front and also as a Soviet player he played the main controller many times so um, I think the, the, the difficulty will be holding the, the faction together and making sure everyone uh, everyone is going towards Moscow uh, and it might work out might work out for them but uh, yeah it will be a very exciting front to see all three fronts will be very exciting uh, yeah. we have some good matchups here indeed we do also yeah. I think uh, it's interesting um, the Soviets, I, we talked about it in the last pre-game analysis, that either you do like this infantry defense in depth thing that Dawn often likes to do, or you do like tanks and uh, rocket art and stuff. And uh, uh, if you have the defense in depth, the focus on infantry and things like that, you might have an easier time defending, but you have a harder time punching back and uh, vice versa. So it will be very interesting to see how the Soviets play this, because we have seen a lot of great defenses from the Soviets in the recent games. We haven't had any really like total overruns of the Eastern Front. Even the times where the Axis have managed to eke out the victory against the Soviets, it has often been uh, long and hard fought and uh, quite late in the game. But in total, I will have to agree with uh, Johannes here. I think there's a slight edge for the German team, the Axis. But I would say the tipping point for me is that we have Yugoslavia in our team. Just last game I had to kill a Soviet 1.2 million Yugoslavians uh, and still didn't capitulate their, their, the country. So it's a lot of meat on the front line and meat on the front line is not a bad thing in this game. It makes harder to uh, move towards the Axis and counterattack. So yeah, slight edge uh, Axis here. Yeah, I, I like that. Yugoslavia is a country that's uh, recently being overlooked because sometimes they're not playing. But this time uh, with Eirik also playing Yugoslavia, who has uh, a bit of experience, um, that could definitely tip, uh, like uh, tilt the scale um, in that direction as well, being that extra unit of micro um, moving around. Yeah. Will we see Garrett on Hungary? <laughs> no comments. <laughs> yeah, the no, Hans only been to too. cover the front line as <laughs> axis. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is looking but, up to be a very exciting game. I say. I, I think as a as a naval player uh, or one of the players uh, focusing on navy most of the time, I think we should also comment a little bit on the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah, I think that's uh, many times overlooked, and uh, also that could give. Um, especially the axis a very big edge or to stop a d-day before it happens uh, so to speak um, i mean we've seen quite a few games where axis wins basically on with submarines uh, raiding all the canadian armor trying to move across the atlantic or something similar um and and i can just open up with saying i now again i'm going to put some thoughts into the head of the players and i'm not going to comment on the uk side as i know pretty much what he's going to do. But I think that um, uh, since Magnus plays Germany for the first time uh, as main controller, um, I think that he will do a conventional build uh, going for a lot of submarines. So uh, I, I think we will see a lot of German subs uh, in the oceans. Um, and having um, uh, Italy with Rosen and also Ivan on Spain, which are the the usual suspect building subs. Um, and also Jonte actually on Bulgaria, who starts with a few dockers as well. I think that we, there will be a quite sub-heavy axis, uh, which could mean some issues for the Allies trying to move across the Atlantic. Uh, so that will be very interesting to see how that game, uh, that plays out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite um, it's a quite low intensity um, challenge for for the raider uh, to build subs and just put them out. Uh, it's it's a little bit harder to to counter it um and i would say it's it's very easy for for germany to uh, with the um, journey's advisor the, the the company uh naval designer company and Dönitz, the admiral you get huge buffs right off the get-go um so it's very important for the uk and maybe even some miners to make it a priority to beat the rating because you can't lose the game on the atlantic that's um I've seen it too many times that allies uh, lose to rating, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's not fun. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, 
even a new player can do a lot of impact with a few dockyards and um, good uh, raiding admiral. Yeah. So um, yeah, let, let's see what happens. Yeah, definitely. We will see what happens. And um, uh, if that was our last front, I think uh, perhaps it's time to round off this pre-game analysis. Or what do you say, my studio comrades? Yeah, we're closing in on 90 minutes now, so I think it's uh, it's time to yeah. wrap. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> in that case, uh, thank you so much to uh, all the work from the officer committee here, setting up all the teams, uh, setting the date, doing all of these nice graphics and uh, uh, steering the Hygge Hoy to, through these new waters that we have uh, now arrived at. We do get the feeling that the community has been uh, very successful lately. Uh, Bygård Hof and the stream there was a success that we could not have imagined once we started it up. And it will be very interesting to see how the community goes from here and what we're able to do in the future with the Twitch and the YouTube channel and uh, and uh, all our different uh, games and shenanigans and uh, hygge, so to speak. So uh, thank you so much for watching this uh, uh, pre-game analysis and the team announcements. And we will see you at uh, 10 o'clock sharp, the 4th of November, where we will watch a case of the Blues, Blues watching the Axis and the Allies duke it out once again in a grand game of the Hygge Hoy community. See you then. See you then. See you then. Yep. Bye.